Hey, welcome, Faithful Politics listeners and viewers. I am your political host, Will Wright, and I'm joined by your faithful host, Josh Bertram, Pastor Josh Bertram. Um, and uh, this week, we hello, hello. we we have Mark Silk uh, with us, who is the director of the Greenberg Center and professor of religion and public life at Trinity College. He's also the author of Spiritual Politics, Religion and America Since World War II, and secular, me, unsecular media, making news of religion in America. Uh, since 2012, he's been a regular blogger and columnist for the religious, Religion News Service, and we are here to talk to him about a very non-controversial article that he wrote um, <laughs> that, that uh, you know, uh, purports to assign a, a pronoun to God. Um, so, so welcome, Mark, for and thank you for being on our show. Well, thanks for, for thanks for having me here, Will and Josh. Uh, delighted to be here. And thank you. Engage in this non-controversial subject. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so, so you you wrote an article recently um, that I I just found absolutely fascinating. Um, and you know, it, it it the the first article, part one, I should say, was was called "Why Our Preferred Pronoun for God Should Be They," and um, it when I read it, I for me, it just kind of clicked. I mean, obviously like, like I'm a believer, but I don't have any ne necessarily any sort of traditional uh, theological training. So it just sort of, it just made sense to me. Um, and, and I'm curious on why, why you wrote uh, that article. Uh, well, I think what inspired me was a, a, a piece that uh, some of you may have read uh, in the New York times by the linguistics professor, John McWhorter, uh, who's a, uh, you know, interesting and provocative guy. And he was talking as linguistics professors do about uh, how exciting it is to see language change in front of one's eyes. And in specifically, he was talking about how, and, and I certainly see this in my students and you see it around how, how the word they is used in place of say he or she uh, these days. So, um, and that's, that looks like it's becoming sort of standard English. I, I used to mm -hmm. cross it out and, and when I got it on student papers and, and now, you know, I don't. Um, and, and part of the reason is uh, I think, you know, these changes happen, happen because people find it convenient. Um, it's certainly less cumbersome to say they than he or she. Um, but of course, it also fits into uh, the culture, the culture wars, but the, but the cultural desire on the part of some people that, um, you know, who, who, who don't want to specify genders for themselves or are unclear about it for others. Um, we live in this world of controversy over transgender stuff. And so... Um, if you're feeling like you don't want to deal with all that stuff or, or, or you uh, prefer that pronoun and, and nowadays in certain circles, you know, you put your name down, uh, you know, Mark Silk, uh, he, him, his, just so people know what pronouns to use. But, but that's a kind of halfway measure. And, and, and so anyway, McWhorter was saying uh, it's, it's exciting and, and, and he sort of thinks it's a good thing that people are using they. Well, um, I thought since I write a column for the religion news service and, and write about religion, uh, what does that mean in terms of pronouns for God? Um, this has been a somewhat neuralgic subject uh, in you know, sort of progressive religious circles for decades. Um, how do we avoid using uh, male pronouns for a being uh, who, uh, and we can get into this, you know, is not male gendered in some uh, human sense, or at least uh, that's what they say. Um, and, and so I suggested a modest proposal. You'll remember Jonathan Swift's modest proposal about you know, eating the children of Ireland. Um, a modest proposal of using uh, they uh, for God. And, and uh, you know, I sort of uh, made reference to the fact that in the Hebrew Bible in, in biblical Hebrew, the word for God, whether it's uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or anybody else's God, 
is the noun Elohim, which in biblical Hebrew is actually a plural form. So I, you know, I sort of suggested maybe slightly uh, waggishly um, that, you know, there's good precedent for not worrying too much about, about the fact that, that, that using they, them, theirs, uh, you know, originally or, you know, starts out as, as a plural form. Um, there were a lot of people who, who didn't like that. <laughs> really? You know? Uh, amazingly enough, uh, you know, various commenters, uh, people uh, who, who go on Twitter um, uh, yelling and screaming about that. And so, uh, and so that's the digital world we live in. And, and then so I thought since there was a lot of attention and it was sort of the most uh, read uh, uh, column for that, you know, in these, you know, the last few days in, on Religion News Service, I would I would take another bite at the apple and try to explain the position more. And that was why I did a, a second one, which, which sort of tried to expand the discussion a little bit. I guess that gives people a, uh, uh, an introduction. Yeah, that's so good. So what, what is the, like, so for those of our listeners who haven't read it and even many of our listeners aren't, um, they, some of them are atheists or they don't really they're not really up to date with theological controversy about gendered language when it comes to God. Um, what What is the heart of the controversy as you see it in terms of gendered language with God? And then what was your argument? Um, I know you explained the basis sure. of it, but even in that follow-up article, what what was, uh, what was were you trying to communicate? Well, I, I think it's fair to say that there are two issues of controversy. One, um, you know, the, what the, uh, you know, Abrahamic tradition, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam uh, pride themselves on, among other things, but, but mainly as being monotheistic religions. So I think uh, some of the sort of freak out was uh, using a plural, uh, or what seemed, you know, starts out as a plural pronoun uh, for God seems to undermine monotheism. So that so we can talk about that in a bit. As far as the, as far as the gender thing is concerned, and I think, in a way, that's uh, more neuralgic these days. Is that, um, you know, what people are familiar with in the current in the current mode is, uh, you know, I'm a I'm a non-binary person. I want to be called they, and uh, maybe I'm trans, or maybe I just feel like you know not being. Uh, sort of uh, put in a particular gendered box and, and therefore call me they. And if you're not on that side of the culture war, if, or if you just find that impossibly awkward, um, then it seems like, you know, any su a suggestion to use the pronoun they for God, you know, is sort of a shoehorning or, or, or trying to lever them into uh, some, some place in the culture that they really, really don't want to be in. Um, and, you know, my, my point, uh, and, and that's, you know, that's fine. Um, the argument, of course, uh, you know, that I, that I made in the second column is that, um, you know, the whole issue of understanding how gendered language, and particularly male language, relates to, uh, relates to God is something that theologians have been uh, chewing on for a long time. Um, there's, you know, some of the smartest, best educated, shrewdest uh, uh, theologians in the Christian tradition are the so-called Cappadocian fathers, um, Gregory of Nyssa and, uh, uh, and, and, and the, other, uh, the other couple. Um, and, you know, they were trained in Greek philosophy and they thought about these things in very sophisticated ways. And, and, uh, and, in, and in fact, uh, St. Gregory of, of Nazianzus uh, um, makes an argument that when it comes to the Trinity, um, uh, that the terms God, the Father, and the Son should be understood as metaphors. Of course, um, where you have a religious tradition that believes uh, that God becomes incarnate, and there seems to be little debate that, that Jesus you know, was incarnated as a male figure, uh, 
um, you have to sort of map um, Jesus, the person's uh, male identity onto a metaphoric reality as the son of the father in the, in, in the Trinity. And, uh, you know, uh, people have been wrestling with the Trinity ever since it was defined in the Council of Nicaea. So uh, this is nothing <laughs> new, but, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a lot to wrestle with. I do think, um, you know, there are lots of, uh, there have always been and continue to be lots of um, Christians and Jews who, who are very comfortable, not just with male pronouns for God, but with, you know, critical um, male metaphors, uh, God the Father, um, God is kind of a husband, um, and certainly the sovereignty language, you know, words of, of you know, king and, 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 and so on. So, so th those are hard to give up. Um, and, and it seems like I'm pushing in that direction. And I suppose for some people I would be, but, um, and this is, this is really, I think the crux of the argument, uh, the fact is that pronouns change and, and, and they're different from language to language. In biblical Hebrew, uh, personal pronouns are differentiated by number, plural and singular, and also by gender. So if you talk to a bunch of women, you use you as the plural second person for women. If you use you in the singular for a woman or a man, you use at or ata. I mean, those are anyone who's studied a little bit of biblical Hebrew uh, is going to have been introduced to those pronouns very early on. And, you know, the, the Germanic tradition that our language is part of originally did have, uh, did differentiate by number. And we preserve that in the King James Version where individuals are called uh, thou and and thee and thy, um, and and pl and plural groups are in, are are addressed as ye and you and 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 your, um, but but it, but old English uh, didn't differentiate by gender. Anybody called you, I mean, in the second person, anyone called you, you could be a woman, you could be a man, uh, you didn't behave in, in Old English or Anglo-Saxon, wasn't like Biblical Hebrew. So these, you know, different linguistic traditions, language traditions uh, behave differently. And the fact is for reasons that, you know, we might want to speculate about, at some point English uh, drops the thee and thou and just goes, uh, goes to you. You had been plural. Um, now it becomes singular. I mean, I just saw a comment on my second column and somebody said, you know, you is absolutely, you know, singular as well as plural. <laughs> well, what do you mean absolutely? Once upon a time, it was not absolutely that. It was just <laughs> plural and at some point it became singular. And, and so people, pe people take a while to get used to that. And no doubt, if it's really the case that English is shifting from, uh, you know, he and she, today, it's going to take people a while. But once that becomes second nature, nobody will think twice about calling God they in the third person, um, just the way they no longer think of, you know, every, you know, every modern translation past, you know, these days past the same, the King James Version uses you to address God. And certainly, yeah. certainly, you know, the, the, evangelical tradition of translation uh, makes a point of trying to bring biblical language up to date so people don't feel alienated by archaisms. And, and sure. you, can, you can read uh, some Bible translations which seem awfully colloquial, but that's the whole point. And, and uh, you know, in some, uh, you know, uh, maybe near term, People are going to feel like they is absolutely normal for the for the third person singular, um, but obviously it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> so what I hear you saying is that you know we have this um, 
tradition in the biblical Hebrew where there was a common word, Elohim, that was plural. And that was used to address gods and a god singular. So it's very natural for them to say Elohim, which was gods, but they meant a singular god in their mind. It wasn't as if they were calling Yahweh multiple gods, um, potentially, right? We don't no, know. I mean, you can think of it this way, Josh. You know, if, if let, let's say uh, there is some group uh, that worships a particular fish, you know, the right. great salmon. And, I do uh, like salmon. Yeah, well, for sure. And, you know, in the Pacific Northwest, salmon have a certain, you know, divine totemic quality. But so let's say, and and we have a text on that. And and the text says, I am, I am fish. You shall have no other fish before me. Right. We do that first fish as singular and the second fish is plural. It's the same mm -hmm. word. We just know that it works both ways. Intuitively. De depending on context, uh, we know when it's singular and when it's plural, but it's the same word. And I think that was true for Elohim. So in the same sentence in the Hebrew Bible, God will say, I am Elohim and you yes. shall have no Elohim before me. And people, it's just like the fish example in the you know, to the readers of the Hebrew Bible at that time, they didn't, they, they understood that this was a word that functioned in the singular and the plural. Now, originally, back in, you know, sort of proto, uh, you know, Jewish times, Israelite times, or, you know, the Semitic languages before Abraham, I mean, however you want to see it, um, sure. presumably, uh, or possibly, I mean, we don't know, it's lost in the midst of time. There are no texts that I've read about that, that say it, but that presumably the reason why the word for God was Elohim was because people were polytheists. There were many gods and right. so you had, uh, you had the plural term, but over time, the language evolved so that the term could also be simply a singular. And I suspect that's that's exactly how it worked. But but I think there is a tendency for people naturally to think that the language they speak is kind of fixed in time. It is their basic metaphysical categories. And so therefore, right. you has to be singular as well as plural, even though there was a time when it wasn't singular. Well, we solved that in the South by saying y'all. Or in uh, Pittsburgh, by saying <laughs> yuns, yuns. And I will, and I will tell you, Virginians, that I lived in Atlanta <laughs> for ten years, working for the Journal Constitution, and I learned how to say not just y'all, but all y'all, all y'all. <laughs> and, and, and and that's exactly and and you're exactly right that that Southern language and the history of of y'all and all y'all would be interesting to know and I don't know it but yes but at some point southerners felt like they you know like they they might could use a plural second person <laughs> and yes and so, and so they I reckon they could exactly I um you know I was thinking as you're talking um so the controversy between like like I totally get how when you when you frame God in male language, you're gonna that changes the way you think about God because you don't typically don't people don't um, at least when they've grown up like I'll just say me like I haven't thought about God in motherly terms although there's plenty of metaphorical language in the Bible that talks about God especially in the Psalms about almost like a motherly or like that God had in the prophets he had a child you know, like pains of childbirth and things like that with the Israelites. And, um, and so I think it's a, it's a great point that we, when, when the kind of language we use frames the way that we view God and even the characteristics of God. And even in some ways, people thinking God is like um, potentially more wrathful, emphasizing that in a male aspect of God versus, you 
uh, maybe more compassion or something like that, that maybe traditionally would have been assigned to female aspects of God. I think one question I'm, I have as, as I'm, as I'm thinking about this, do you know, like in your understanding of language and how it's evolved, like, is there a, an equivalent to our current cultural situation and the political kind of uh, the political tension that's going along with this, the change of language where essentially, you know, like, so language evolves, no doubt. I'm, I'm wondering how much of that has been a political evolution um, and how much of that has been just like a natural evolution where it just happened and no one could point to the time. But I imagine that in 20, 50, 100 years, if it's like, no, we've gotten rid of those pronouns or they is the natural one for a singular, um, they could look back and say, well, there was this huge controversy in, you know, the beginning of the 21st century. And, you know, this is how it came out. Do we have an equivalent that you know of? Um, With language? To, to what we're facing right now. Well, you know, I do think that we certainly engage in cultural struggles over how people will be named. Um, in my time, uh, you know, I can I can remember, you know, it was very important, you know, black people were called Negroes. Um, they, you know, Southern racists called them you know, something that was between the N-word and Negro. Um, there was an issue of orthography, capitalizing Negro or not. Um, at some point, and I remember this when I was young and, you know, in high school, somebody came in, you know, and, and this was uh, in the later phases of the civil rights movement. And so, you know, not an easy time. Um, somebody gave a talk to a bunch of high school students, including me, but, you know, it was sort of a mixed race. I grew up in, in, uh, in a very integrated suburb, Montclair, New Jersey. And, and I remember this white guy saying, using Negro and getting trouble, and then saying, okay, I, I see where you guys are. And so shifted to black. And then you know, Jesse Jackson, I think more than anyone else, introduced African-American. Um, and now we've sort of reverted to Black people. And so, and, and some of these kinds of, of struggles over names really have to do with assertions of uh, cultural uh, presence. You know, you call me what I want you to call me. It's a way of, of, of insisting on that. And I think, um, some of the uh, unhappiness about, you know, using um, they, not just for God, but for anyone, has to do right. with the sense that this is a cultural assertion by people who don't want you to use those gendered pronouns uh, at all. And so, you know, right. so I sort of waded into that, but I think those kinds of struggles over naming uh, and that's true in the, in the, in the, in the purely in the religious realm as well. I mean, you get, you know, some group of pietistic uh, Protestants who are, who are denigrated as Quakers, and then the Quakers decide right. they're going to embrace that. Um, you know, Methodists, even Puritans. though they're the society of friends, um, you know, right. you could, and, and, and so, so, you know, struggles over names, over over how people are identified, I think, are built into the way we societies do their cultural business, and and they and they do include you know struggles over or assertions of cultural power. I get to I get to make you call me what I want, um, but mm -hmm. but I think it's important to sort of recognize that that sometimes. Uh, that may be behind a, a, an evolution in language, and sometimes maybe not so much. I mean, I'll give you an example, which I've been sort of thinking about because of these columns. Um, you say, well, well, why did you replace thou? Um, 
you know, what, what's behind that? Well, I mean, we know sort of when it happens. And, and actually, I, I came across some guy who teaches uh, courses at the University of Houston who looked at Shakespeare's language. And it turns out mm. that Shakespeare uses both in the singular. And thou is sort of the more familiar usage. How do I love thee? Let me, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but in a more formal sense, uses, uses uh, you. Uh, so if you're talking, you know, business stuff. Now, it seems to me that's not really consistent with the English tradition, which is just singular and plural. There's no difference. But, but after the, the, the Norman conquest, when the you know, French-speaking uh, Normans came in and conquered England in 1066, you get this amalgamation of you know, lots of French words uh, brought into English. And, 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 there's, and English after the, the conquest becomes a very different kind of Germanic language than it was before. And I think, uh, this is purely speculative, that, that the use of you is, is actually a kind of Frenchified use because the French use vous in that way. And no doubt French speaking lords talking to peasants would say vous, vous, you, you. Um, uh, so, but, but, the, but the interesting thing is that what that means, so, so, so in English in, by Shakespeare's time, people are using thee and thou uh, for familiar, and you know, for loving relationships and you for more formal ones. And yet the King James Version, interestingly, preserving the old style, uses thee and thou in the second person, including for God. Well, what that means, I think is, uh, you know, you could speculate, is that for ordinary people, when the King James Version comes out, actually the, the words for God make God more familiar because they're used the way the French used too. It's, it's, and the way the English, you know, you use that in a loving relationship, you use thee and thou. To our yeah. ear, that sounds very formal, like thou, you know, it's the King James Version. It's an archaic thing. But I, I, I <laughs> yes. wondered, and I've written to the guy who did this thing, you know, don't you think that actually, um, you know, that, that that kind of language comes in. So I just think these things are very interesting. They're worth exploring. Um, yes. You know, I hope people aren't too offended, but, you know, part of what I do is <laughs> uh, yeah. trouble. And, and so there it is. <laughs> Good trouble. Um, so, so Mark, you know, when, when we, um, we had an opportunity to talk to Kristen Dumay um, about her book, Jesus, um, and John, John Wayne, Wayne. Yeah. <laughs> great book, by the way. I mean, uh, really, really great book. And, you know, one of the, one of the, the themes in the book was sort of kind of like the, the patriarchal system that exists in our society and our church, you know, is, is sort of like a self licking ice cream cone, you know, that basically right. it's just, um, it's just, it just perpetuates itself. And, and I'm wondering how much like, like in your opinion, you know, do you think like the importance of having kind of like these masculine pronouns, you know, contribute to this idea of, you know, the role that men are supposed to have like within the church setting, you know? And, and I was just, I was thinking about, you know, maybe some of the comments that you were getting, some of the criticism you were getting, you know, if, if it was coming from sort of this place of you're, you're trying to affect my identity of who I am, you know, if God has to be male, has to be a he, because like that, that, that if he was anything else, then I, you know, I'm not necessarily maybe as manly in the church as I, you know, want to be. So what, what, what are your thoughts? Oh, well, I think there's no question. Uh, I mean, as Josh, you're certainly familiar with the sort of gender wars uh, within evangelicalism generally. Um, the question of whether women can preach, uh, you know, is 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 has been a, a a tough issue, and 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 also the role, the 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 different roles of the husband and wife in marriage, and who's in charge, and um, you know. The, and, and so you have a kind of um, uh, 
you know, some of us, I, I would say a kind of rear guard action, but it, but a very strong one, um, uh, pushing against the pressure in society, which has been going on in, in American society, certainly since the early phases of the women's movement in the middle of the 19th century, um, uh, to say, you know, a Christian family is one in which the father is the, the, the man is the head of the household and the woman is, is playing a subordinate role, important, has to be respected, so on and so on and so on, but not uh, in charge. And I think um, any, a, a, and the model, I mean, as, as has been the case in Protestantism from the beginning of seeing the family as a little church, um, uh, you know, is very much along the lines of the metaphors used in the Bible for God as husband. And so we model that metaphor in our family. And so anything that seems to threaten those representations or just to say, well, that's a metaphor, but you know, Josh points out there are these childbirth, there are these, there are these male ones. I, I know my, my old teacher when I was uh, in, in college and graduate school, uh, Caroline Bynum, um, one of the great medievalists of our time, uh, wrote an essay, which, which really was her most important sort of thing early in her career, uh, looking at, at monks in the 12th and 13th century and how they used very strong female uh, imagery, not just not for God the Father, but for Jesus. I mean, Jesus's breasts and those, those kinds of metaphors. Um, and they were used by male monks. And, and so uh, Caroline's uh, article was, and, and the book of collection is called, you know, uh, Jesus as Mother. Um, that's more shocking even you know than than <laughs> than metaphors for for God in the in the whole sense because I think people can right. kind of get their minds around the idea that that God you know taken in the monotheistic even though trinitarian way is is a is a transcendent being uh, the idea that that there would be medieval monks addressing Jesus in some, you know, the incarnate way uh, as, as mother. Um, I think that's, you know, that's sort of shocking, but, but those metaphors are powerful for people because of their own personal experience. If you are getting nourishment, um, what is more powerful as a human image uh, than the maternal image? And, 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 you know, the power of metaphors are such that people uh, don't want to feel like you're pushing them to give them up. And that's why I said at the end of the second column, just because, you know, the language says that you can, you, you know, address God as they doesn't mean you have to give up your favorite male metaphors. You can keep those if you want. Other people don't keep them. I think, you know, it's, these are, um, you know, you don't get away from them from the metaphors in the Bible, just because you use a different pronoun, they still sit there unless you're going to, you know, expurgate the Bible. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, I mean, I, I, this is such a fascinating conversation. I, so I went to um, Drew University. I went to Gordon Conwell um, for a year and then I went to Drew University. So there's a stark difference between those two institutions. For sure. And um, yes, and at, and at Drew University, there's a gender inclusive um, policy that I wasn't even aware of until I violated it. <laughs> and then they made me very aware of the gender inclusive policy um, in my prayers, which I prayed and I prayed to a father. Um, and I was told that. Um, you know, that was okay for my private prayers, but in the classroom setting, we don't address God as father. We address God as divine parent or something, some gender in, in inclusive. And so I was so upset by that experience that it made the pendulum in my own heart swing so far to the conservative side on this argument that it's hard for me, if I'm honest, um, to even start to entertain the ideas of, of changing the way that we address God. Even though I hear the arguments and in, in intellectually, 
they make sense. Like, you know, the, the metaphors for uh, the, those female attributes of God. And of course, get, we are made in God's image, including male and female. It's very clear from, from the scripture. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's just, it's, it's hard for me. It's a struggle if I'm, if I'm totally honest about it. And I was thinking as we were, you know, as we were talking, like, so, and, and maybe you can help like kind of, um, unravel the knot, so to speak. But so the question is when God was revealing himself in this chosen language of Hebrew and then Greek and Aramaic at the time that he revealed himself. And of course that depends on your views of divine inspiration, all of that. And we know that that's all been debated and it's all up for a lot of debate. So as God's revealing himself in those languages, is there something, is it just a condescension on God's part? to, for instance, like a condescension to say, hey, I got to speak in a way that they're going to understand. So I'm going to do this in a patriarchal form. Or is there something ontological that that we are to take from it or or both? And I just I'm wondering about your thoughts on that. Well, you know, I, I, th I think, uh, you know, you've got to take. I mean, I'm not a professional theologian. I do sure. strongly believe in pluralism, so I think, you know, and I also think that uh, um, we all, whatever our religious tradition, when we're, we're when we're trying to answer such questions, we all look through it glass darkly if we can yeah, no quote, doubt. That, uh, quote that scripture. yes um no doubt so, you know i mean i made a slight joke with which somebody today didn't wasn't amused by saying you know i'm prepared to bet <laughs> that god wouldn't wouldn't be too upset um and i actually changed that from my editor who said you know i'm convinced that i'm i'm not convinced of anything you know <laughs> as, uh, um i i do think that um you know, we we we've certainly seen uh, in the long sweep of the, you know, Abrahamic theology, an evolution in conceptions of uh, of God, from right. from a being who may well have been one of a number of gods floating around the Middle East, as understood, um, to uh, you know, the God of the philosophers of a series of perfections, all knowing all, you know, I, I mean, you know, and the accounts of God in the Garden of Eden, looking around for Adam, I mean, you know, what's up with that? So, so we have, <laughs> you know, in biblical texts, you know, a range of ways, including, you know, something that, uh, that approaches, if not quite the God of the philosophers, something you know, really, really big and beyond, um, you know. Right, totally. The, the last in the Hebrew Bible, in the arrangement that, uh, that, that we Jews have, um, the last words directly attributed to God come at the end of the book of Job. And after Job's sort of reproach, but, but, but the context there is, you know, you don't know anything. You've not done anything. You can't talk about me. Um, you know, you can't. But but the whole story begins with this kind of parable-like encounter where, you know, let's test out Job. Um, so, so, so I think, um, you know, these are hard questions. But, but personally, and, you know, this one speaks personally, I think... Um, Sure. Something on a pretty, on a pretty grand non-gendered scale, is uh, in order uh, when I want to think about a plausible God, and uh, and at the same time, or you know, there's. I mean, I think religion is made for people to make use of in ways that it's possible for them to use it. And that means it has to be, it has to work in terms of their cultural context. 
sometimes that cultural context uh, creates all kinds of trouble in the next era. Um, if one of the things that I teach and I'm teaching this semester is the different views of slavery at the time of the Civil War. And there's no question mm. but that, you know, pro-slavery Southern pastors can talk about biblical texts which accept slavery as a normal course of, you know, slaves obey your masters or, you know, whatever it is because, right. and, and, and you can say that's God's way of saying slavery is okay. Or you can say as the Northern pastors who were abolitionists or, you know, opposed to slavery said, you know, those aren't normative statements about slavery coming from God. Those are accepting right. the way the world was at the time. And if you look at the principles that lie at the heart of this tradition, they have to push against enslaving people. All right, that's a debate over, you know, a critical issue in American history, which um, we still struggle with. Uh, in our time, you know, the original sin of American, of the, of the American Republic. Um, and, and so, you know, trying to differentiate what's culturally uh, convenient or contextual for people at that time from what really, really is going on becomes you know, can turn into a war or a, a fighting war like like the Civil War or a war <laughs> over gender, the gender yes. notions of who God is. And, yes. you know, one would like to think that these things over time get ironed out in the right way. Uh, we hope that that's the case. We can't depend on it. Um, I think one of the things to return to my original, you know, sort of, uh, Collins, one of the things that, you know, if, if English really is, is substituting they as a normal thing, the way you becomes right. the normal thing earlier, what that means is people who want to hold on to those male metaphors will do that with they. People who don't like them will use they too. They'll use all of the, the pronouns work just the way you does for everybody. And then you fight over metaphors. You don't fight over the pronouns <laughs> in liturgy. I, I think that's sure. a step forward because it's more inclusive. Um, but, you know, and, and look, it, it took evidently centuries for people who English speakers to accept and just take for granted that you is the singular second person. We're talking about a process which got underway just about yesterday. Um, <laughs> and we think it's gonna be, yeah. you know, would like to solve it tomorrow and it's not gonna happen. Um, so, you know, we just have to believe that, you know, over time, assuming we survive climate change, um, this will all sort of go back. <laughs> Yeah. Do, 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 you, do you think that the, the majority of your criticisms were based, you know, kind of like, and like through a, a political lens? I mean, there's a lot of folks that, you know, talk about woke culture and all kinds of other stuff. Or, or, or do you think that a lot of your criticisms are, you know, people that, you know, feel like they've got a, a, a firm understanding of, of biblical etymology or something like that? Well, you know, I think one one kind, you know way to understand some of that stuff is somebody who's very angry does a drive-by tweet. You know, drive-by um, tweet. I like that. And, and 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 then hundreds of people retweet it. Who <laughs> you know because they understand you know because they, they feel. You know they're 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 willing to spread that anger around. Um, are they thinking about the issue? Did they even get to the column? Are they just retweeting something, you know, that 
that's one of the, you know, that, that, that allows them to vicariously participate in the drive-by? I don't know. Um, I think for the people who've taken the time uh, to, to, to make actual comments on the website or, or, you know, and I do think that, that when you ask people to comment, you know, talk about changes in the language, what they mostly understand that to mean is, what do you have negative to say about it? Con <laughs> you know, most comments are, you know, it's like, if you, you know, because if you, if you like it, all you do is, is do a thumbs up emoji or something. <laughs> I mean, you know, so, 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 but anyway, um, you know, I, th I think they, I mean, you know, I'm not going to deny, it, you know, that it, I certainly intended the column provocatively. It was meant to, to, to poke those people a little bit and they got poked and they didn't like it. Um, you know, some people did like it. Uh, the second column is trying to be a little bit more ironic, you know, I, I, and, and, and tell them that they can have their male metaphors and, and still use they, you know, but right. or, <laughs> use they and still have their, 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 their metaphors. But, um, you know, I, I think it's good to provoke people if you provoke them to thought, if you simply provoke mm. them to, you know, to, to pull out their AKs and, and, and shoot at you, um, that's not so good. I, I have mixed feelings about, you know, uh, Twitter and, and these kinds of ways of expressing your uh, polemical, you know, uh, emotions. But, you know, uh, you hope that, um, I mean, I, I, I once, uh, you know, spent a few years writing edit newspaper editorials for a living down in Atlanta. And I always thought that, you know, you shouldn't try to preach to the choir and just wave, you know, wave the wet towel. Um, uh, because, you know, what's the point of that? And, and then there were going to be people way over on the other side who you were never going to reach. So the ideal audience with people who were mildly uh, in disagreement um, or moderately in mis disagreement, but who you could hope to get to think a little bit more about their position. Um, you know, Josh, you're the perfect uh, audience for, for my columns. If, if uh, you know, y y people who, I, I, I had dinner with a friend the other day. I mean, it was, you know, a little uh, small vaccinated dinner, you know, lunch party. <laughs> uh, and um, she was. Were you guys uh, wearing your hazmat suits? No, not at all. Not at all. But we live in a in a low uh, a low COVID incidence uh, town. Anyway, um, and, and and she has a a a, a trans uh, nephew, I guess, uh, um, and was struggling with they. You know, we were talking about this. And, and I just said, you know, look, there's going to come a time when everybody gets called day. It's like what happened with you. And, you know, don't sweat it. And she claimed that that, 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 that was helpful to think about it that way. So that hmm. I, I thought that was a good thing. And, and it doesn't. Yeah. And I don't really mean it to say, you know, although it certainly could come out that way, but you know, to say, you know, I'm now going to beat you up to use they, it's just, it seems to be happening. That's what McWhorter, mm. that's his point. The lang language is, language evolves, whether you like it or not. And, you know, we may not have want, you know, it may have offended people at some point to say, you know, you is a plural, is a plural pronoun. How can I ad address God as you? You know, at some point, those people either die out or whatever, and they say, well, you know, not a problem. <laughs> wow. So, so <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, I, I have one last question for you and that's um, wh when are you writing the article um, regarding the most biblically accurate emoji for God? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> you know, I haven't looked at them all, but I, but I'm prepared to believe, um, you know, that one doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> is it the print? Is it the print? That's good. I like that. Or <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, it would. It would. I, I guess. You know, I think there's some wonderful art 
depicting God, although one of the, you know, in some ways my favorite one doesn't show any person other than, than the arm Michelangelo on the Sistine Chapel coming out and touching <laughs> Adam. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, there is a tradition, it's certainly a tradition in Islam, but it's, there's also a strong um, iconoclastic or anti-icon tradition in Judaism and, and in, 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 in Eastern Christianity. I mean, it's complicated and certainly in Protestantism um, where, where people worried about physical representations of any people, but, but particularly of, and of, of course there's a strong iconographic tradition as well. So, um, so the, the use of emojis is, um, you know, emotional too. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but I, I'd go for something I think a little more abstract than, than, than the bearded, uh, although we, you know, we did put uh, for, for the art for these columns, you know, sort of traditional representation. Though I must say, if you look at the first column, the, um, the, the one I chose was William Blake's uh, representation of, of, of sort of God the Father, but you know, behind the beard is a, is a pretty um, sort of, I would say, gender ambiguous face. Yes. Uh, and, I was going to ask and, you about why you chose that one. Uh, you know, I chose it for a reason because I thought, you know, here's, here's, you know, a bearded, God looking kind of, you know, um, <laughs> traditional in one sense. And yet, uh, you know, William Blake's a complicated guy and, and, and has interesting theological thoughts. And, um, and it's hard for me not to think that he, you know, painted that, that, that painting in a way that left open the possibility of more non-traditionally male attributes, put it that way. Mm. Wow. That's, that's, awesome. that's so interesting. So um, thank you so much, Mark, for spending some time with us. This was yes, super you. fascinating okay. and well, educational. It's really, really been a, a pleasure, Will and Josh. I, I, I can't say how important I think it is for there to be conversations like the ones you're holding in which people can have thoughtful conversations without, you know, throwing, throwing, bombs at each other um uh, and uh, good luck with it <laughs> yeah tweet, we really appreciate drive by yeah. tweets or tweet. yeah i mean like we we know a few things about that like we did three episodes about critical race theory so like we know a thing or two about <laughs> drive by oh, <and> yeah. tweets. <laughs> so uh th thank you again mark uh we really okay. appreciate you spending time and have a good, good one good luck thanks. going forward guys all right thank you so much bye-bye <laughs> thank you bye-bye